Hello, my name is Dr. Rob Snyder, and I'm professor and director of clinical research at Barry University School of Podiatric Medicine. My talk today is going to surround the utilization of autologous blood clot tissue matrix in the treatment of chronic wounds in patients with diabetes. As far as my disclosures are concerned, I am a consultant for Red Dress Limited, which is a company out of Israel. So here's a typical neuropathic ulcer in a patient with diabetes. Well, what would you do here? Well, uh, some of the standard of care are pretty straightforward. We're going to debris, we're going to offload, and we're going to use moist wound healing. And in, in many cases, uh, when you have patients like this with significant um, uh, hyperkeratosis to the peri wound, all of that needs to be debrided away. But, but more importantly, we really have to think in terms of treating these patients holistically. <clears throat> As an example, um, the methodology that is most often used and discussed is wound bed preparation. Of course, again, this is a holistic way of viewing the patient even before we begin treating the wound itself. So first and foremost, um, is the wound even healable? If the wound is healable, of course, we would use whatever aggressive means possible to get this ulceration to heal. Maybe the wound is palliative. Maybe the patient has a terminal illness. Maybe the patient is uh, non-compliant. There are a whole host of reasons why wounds would not heal. So first and foremost, um, it's important to understand this dynamic. Secondly, we need to identify and treat the cause. Just because a wound looks like a neuropathic ulcer doesn't necessarily mean that it is. It could be a skin cancer. It could be a vasculitis. So it's very important to make the diagnosis before you begin thinking of a treatment regime. We must address patient-centered concerns. Obviously, in dealing with individuals, particularly with underlying comorbidities, we have to consider treating the whole patient and not just the hole in the foot or the leg. Of course, uh, this would mean that we have to evaluate their vascularity, what their hemoglobin A1C may be, what their lipid profile is, when the last time they saw the physician, uh, what, what exactly was the report that they got, recent blood work, et cetera. Treating the whole patient, not just the whole. Once we get past that stage, then we can begin in earnest looking at the wound itself. And one easy way to remember how to evaluate these wounds is DIME, D-I-M-E. D for debridement. I for control of infection or inflammation, E for moisture or M for moisture balance or imbalance, and E for wound edge preparation. And we'll discuss in a moment the importance of that wound edge effect. So some important things to keep in mind, wound bed preparation clearly will prepare the wound to accept an advanced product if in fact it's required. It's also an important step in treating the wound and lastly, protecting against wound infection. But sometimes despite even our best efforts, uh, treating these chronic wounds are very much like lifting a 200 pound tree stump. Uh, these are often very difficult to treat, challenging to heal, and we'll look at some reasons why in a moment. So our objectives for this lecture are fairly straightforward. We're going to explain the epidemiology of the diabetic foot, list the differences between acute and chronic wound biochemistry. We're going to talk a little bit about the extracellular matrix, a very, very important structure in the skin. We're going to learn about autologous blood clot tissue and what this matrix does as, as far as accelerating wound healing. And lastly, I hypothesize the potential mechanism of action of this topically applied blood clot tissue. So first, an overview of diabetes. And let's first turn our attention to the United States. In 2015, as per the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there were approximately 30.3 million people in the United States with diabetes. 
it is projected by 2050, which is not that far away, that 12% of the population will be affected at that time. Currently, it's about 9.4% of the population. Pretty staggering results. In 2007, diabetes was the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. It caused more than 71,000 people to succumb to this illness. These statistics from 2020 from the National Diabetes Statistics Report are even more sobering. Uh, during uh, 1999 to 2002, the prevalence estimates of diabetes were about 9.5%. In 2013 to 2016, they were 12%. But the most startling thing here was the fact that patients were getting diabetes as far as diagnosis is concerned earlier in the paradigm. So people 18 and over really were studied, but younger populations were evaluated. And it was found that we started to see a significant uptick in younger patients with diabetes who will likely live longer because of the treatments that we now have available for the disease, but are also likely to succumb to some of the very unfortunate sequela of this disease. So if you, if you look at this chart, you can see the total number of diabetics, the total number of diagnosed diabetics, which really doesn't coincide necessarily with the total number of diabetics in the United States. But lastly, the undiagnosed diabetic. Now, this is the tsunami that we have to pay attention to uh, because these individuals are going to go unchecked for a much longer period of time and ultimately may wind up succumbing to significant complications from this disease. Now, as we all know, diabetes is not a, uh, a disease that's just localized to the United States. It is a global epidemic. By 2030, the number of people with diabetes globally uh, is likely estimated to rise at, and I hope you're sitting down when I show you this number, a half a billion people. A half a billion people will develop this disease and many of them will succumb to complications of this devastating problem. So when patients are hospitalized with diabetes, years ago they were hospitalized because their blood sugars were out of control. The medications we had at the time were not really that good. Now we have medications that not only decrease uh, patients' blood sugars, uh, but also can prevent heart disease from diabetes. So we have a lot more options for these patients. So when patients are admitted to the hospital, they're not admitted for insulin drips, they're usually admitted for foot infections or complications from low extremity disease. The annual incidence is about 4%, the lifetime risk 25%, and it's likely approaching even greater than that number. 15% of diabetic foot ulcers result in lower extremity amputation. 85% of all lower limb amputations in patients with diabetes are preceded by an ulcer. And of course, peripheral neuropathy, um, uh, both sensory, autonomic, and motor, are major contributing factors. They are the causality of the ulceration. You have foot deformity, you have callus, you have dry skin, but the reason in many cases why patients lose limbs is because of infection and peripheral arterial disease. There are 1 million amputations globally in patients with diabetes. That's one every 30 seconds. So just think for a moment how long you're sitting here listening to this lecture. Every 30 seconds somewhere in the world is losing a part of their body to diabetes. There was a recent study that just came out that looked at the mortality rates of even minor amputations and it found that the mortality rate dramatically increased even in those scenarios. In the United States, a study done uh, a couple of years ago by Harold Bremen and colleagues showed that there were approximately 1,200 major amputations performed every week in the United States. So these are devastating results and certainly they can uh, be catastrophic from a medical standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint as well.
So how serious is the neuropathic ulcer in a patient with diabetes? Well, I, I think many of you are familiar with the study by David Armstrong and colleagues. It was, it was uh, published in 2007. And what he did was he compared the mortality rates of patients with neuropathic ulcers to cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, Hodgkin's disease. And what he found that nearly half of all neuropathic ulcers resulted in death within five years, much greater proportion than prostate cancer, breast cancer, and Hodgkin's disease. So of course, when you first look at these statistics, you can make the assumption that patients aren't dying from the neuropathic ulcer, they're dying from the diabetes. Well, this next study may change your mind. This was a study uh, looking at the history of foot ulcers, increasing mortality amongst individuals with diabetes. It was a 10 year study. It was done out of Norway, a very large population based study uh, examined association between foot ulcers and patients with diabetes, patients with diabetes and mortality risk. And they controlled for disease factors. They compared diabetics and non-diabetics and found something which we believed all along was the case, but certainly this solidified it. Foot ulcers were independently associated with an increased mortality risk. It even gets worse because patients with diabetes and a foot ulcer had an increased mortality risk of almost 2.5 fold, 229% compared to non-diabetic subjects. And most startling in patients with diabetes, the presence of a foot ulcer alone increased mortality risk by almost 50%. So I think it's safe to say that just having a neuropathic foot ulcer in a patient with diabetes is a marker for death. So I wrote an article in 2010 just proffering this um, this um, dynamic and was criticized for it. Even though I had some good data, I had David Armstrong's work, I had others. Um, the common thinking at the time was that it wasn't the ulcer at all. It was the diabetes. It wasn't until 2016 when David Margolis and colleagues uh, looked at this again in diabetes medicine and stated that this could not be explained by any other common risk factors. So clearly just having a neuropathic ulcer is an independent predictor of mortality. So consider this option. You have a, a very busy general practitioner. Uh, he or she is uh, walking down the hall and goes into treatment room one. There's a young woman there with an abnormal mammogram. What is that physician going to do? He's going to, he or she is going to send that patient to a breast specialist or a breast surgeon for a bias, standard of care. The same doctor walks into room two and there's a 65 year old man with a PSA that has been significantly elevated from his last visit. That patient is going to be referred to a urologist, despite the fact that there's compelling evidence that the PSA may not be as useful as we thought it was, and many of the cancers that it's picking up likely would not kill that individual because they're, such, they're so slow growing. Now this same doctor walks into treatment room three and now sees this patient. This patient will likely get a cream he or she doesn't need, will be put on an antibiotic he or she doesn't need, no offloading, no debridement, and will be sent home. Now we will see this patient in about a week or two in the, in the emergency room, likely with necrotizing fasciitis, which has a 20% mortality rate. So I think it behooves us as medical professions, professionals and as wound care specialists that we alert our primary care physicians uh, to this fact and the importance of an early referral. So what is the problem? Well, we know from a macroscopic level what it is, but what, what's going on, what we can't see? Well, first and foremost, we have the wound healing continuum. This is a very orderly, well-orchestrated way of the body's ability to heal things, to heal open wounds. And of course, first and foremost, you start out with hemostasis, which is a vascular response. You then move fairly quickly into the inflammatory phase of wound healing, where you have macrophages, large numbers of neutrophils. 
You then move into the reparative phase or the proliferative phase of wound healing and ultimately the remodeling phase of wound healing, which leads to scar formation. This can take a significant period of time. Now, in a chronic wound, one of the major problems is that the wound is stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing. And that will be very critical in making decisions about how to treat these patients. So if you look at this cartoon, you can see that this is a very complex process. And, I, and of course, this cartoon doesn't really do the process justice because it's significantly more complex than this. But you can see that the phases are overlapping. They're all occurring at the same time. That could be the reason why some areas of a wound may heal or appear to be healing more quickly than another. So when do you think about wound healing? Well, I kind of um, think of it in terms of how I would look at my television screen or my computer screen. The only time we really think about it is when it's not working. And that's exactly what happens with the chronic wound. So this was a proposed mechanism of chronicity of a diabetic foot wound. This was proposed by Robert Kersner in 2010, but there were many articles written. The most pivotal one, the seminal one, was by Falanga and colleagues in 2004. And what was discovered and what we believe is true today are the following. First and foremost, in a chronic wound, you have unresponsive or senescent cells. Now, senescent cells aren't dead. They're just sleeping. They are sluggish. If you do nothing to senescent cells to waken them up, what's going to happen is you will have replicative senescence. So you will have a tumor of growth cells, but they will occur so slowly that you're not going to have wound healing. A very important aspect of this is the non-migratory hyperproliferative wound edge. If you look at a wound as real estate, most clinicians work in this area here, right in the center that's red. They don't really consider what's going on outside. And when you have a non-migratory hyperproliferative wound edge, two things occur. Number one, keratinocytes cannot move past it to re-epithelialize the wound. Number one. Number two, if nothing is done, then those wound edges will likely curl, a process called epiboly. And when that occurs, the body views the wound as healed and doesn't do anything physiologically to help it. Thirdly, you have very high levels of proteolytic toxic environment. In an acute wound, these are seen at very low levels, but in chronic wounds, they're seen at very high levels, and they can do significant damage to the underlying tissue, which we'll discuss in a few moments. Diabetic patients particularly have deficient or unavailable growth factors or receptor sites. So even if growth factors are present, if the receptor sites are not working properly, a physiologic response will not occur. And lastly, we have bacterial interference. Now, Marty Robson's work uh, a number of years ago clearly showed that any, any uh, bacterial loads greater than 10 to the fifth CFU will likely result in delayed healing or non-healing. But what is also need to be, needing to be considered is the fact that bacteria release their own enzymes, which could also be entirely destructive as well. So, even though we're looking at a diabetic model here, all chronic or stalled wounds share a common a commonality of biochemistry, really irrespective of the underlying etiology. Now we have another wrinkle which has been added, and that is the biofilm. These are uh, uh, bacteria that show heterogeneity. There's a whole host of different bacteria, and they're encased in a glycocalyx, this polysaccharide matrix, and usually attached to a structure. They're very difficult to treat, very little penetrates it, unless you're going to be debriding the wound and detaching the biofilm from, from its underlying uh, structure, uh, you're not going to necessarily release whatever bacteria is sitting in that glycocalyx. We also know that probably 100% of all chronic wounds have some type of biofilm. So this is again something we need to think very seriously about because the bacteria in that biofilm uh, are very slow from a metabolic rate, so systemic antibiotics will not work, and many of the topical agents will not work either. We do have some that may, but um, uh, again, a problem that needs to be dealt with.
So let's look at healing rates in patients with diabetes utilizing standard of care and how well are we actually doing. Well, this was a study done 20 years ago by David Margolis. It was the first meta-analysis looking at this process. And what he did was he looked at 12 weeks and 20 weeks based on standard of care, which was offloading, moist wound healing, and wound debridement. What he found was at 12 weeks with a pretty large N of 450, about 24% of wounds actually healed. And at 20 weeks, about 31% of wounds actually healed. And this data provided clinicians with a realistic assessment of what our chances were in actually healing these wounds. But uh, it also showed us, and, and, and to our frustration, that irrespective of what we did from a a uh, standard of care standpoint, these wounds continue to be challenging. Now, this meta-analysis um, was done, as I said, 20 years ago, but we just now had some very recent data that was just published in 2020 by Parks and Colleagues. It was in Diabetes 2020, Supplement 1. This is a recent meta-analysis looking at 16 randomized clinical trials, a lot larger than what Margolis had looked at in 1999. And he looked at uh, Parks looked at healing rates. Uh, at six weeks, healing rates were about 15%. At 12 weeks, about 33%. And at 20 weeks, about 43%. So this was better. Certainly, the results had improved over the past 20 years. However, the endpoints still remain very low. So it gives us a, a, an important insight to how important advanced therapies are in this patient group. Now, we did a study in 2010 with a surrogate endpoint of four weeks to try to determine whether or not we could predict wound healing by week 12. This was a study that was originally done by Peter Sheehan and colleagues in 2003. Now, the title of his article was that uh, the surrogate endpoint of 50% area reduction by week four was a robust predictor of healing by week 12 just didn't sit well with me because many of those patients that did reach 50% failed to heal by week 12. So we repeated this study on a larger cohort of patients, and we found some pretty significant results. If the wound didn't reach 50% by week four, the likelihood of healing was between two and 5%. So that basically means if you reverse those numbers, 95 to 98% of all ulcerations that don't reach that 50% threshold will not heal by week 12. But what was also startling is the number of patients that did reach 50% but still didn't heal. So somewhere between 40 and 48% still didn't heal. So what did this study tell us? Well, it told us two things. Number one, that clinicians should have a sense of urgency to move forward with advanced therapies and to do it early. In fact, in our study, we even found that we could make that prediction at two weeks. The reason why we used four weeks is because it had greater sensitivity and specificity. But what about that next eight weeks? What about those patients that reach 50% but still don't heal? So my mentor, Dr. Robert Warner, was a very good friend and, and uh, taught me uh, a lot through many years of, of kind of standing by his side, unfortunately recently passed away. But he looked at the original data and again agreed, what about the next eight weeks? So we went ahead and looked at the data again, looking at those next eight weeks, and we found some very interesting results. Ulcers that failed to progress or worsen from weeks four to six, and those that failed to achieve 90% area reduction at week eight, we're unlikely to heal by week 12. So now we have three surrogate endpoints, 50% in four weeks, four to six weeks, the wound doesn't progress or worsens, 90% by week eight. We have three significant endpoints that we can now look at in making decisions about advanced therapy. So it's no longer necessary to use a dartboard to decide when to begin advanced therapies. We now have some validated surrogate endpoints to help us make that decision. And the 50% in four weeks has actually been repeated additional times uh, in Europe, and they came up with the same conclusion. 
So let's turn our attention to the extracellular matrix. The skin, of course, is the largest organ in the body, and the largest structure in the skin is the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is composed of collagen, elastin, fibronectin, glycamine, glycans, etc. It is extraordinarily important, and we've known for years that it is the infrastructure or the architecture of the skin. It holds the cells, it gives the skin integrity, and also it allows a cushioning effect. But what we didn't know is that there were other things that were at play with this structure. So when you think about the extracellular matrix and the importance of it, we have to also think in terms of proteases, which are protein degrading enzymes. The ones that we are most familiar with are matrix metalloprotease or MNPs, 2, 8, and 9. There's also serine elastase. Another name for serine elastase is human neutrophil elastase. So think about the fact that wounds that are stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing and are chronic have a significant number of neutrophils. So the neutrophils are pouring out human neutrophil elastase. Now, normally when you see the extracellular matrix, uh, again, this architecture, um, and you see the um, uh, the proteases involved, these proteases are controlled. They're controlled by things like TIMPs, tissue inhibitors of metalloproteases. They're synthesized and stored as an inactive proenzyme, and they function optimally under physiologic conditions, but left unchecked, they can actively and collectively destroy this entire extracellular matrix. So, as I mentioned, the extracellular matrix is the architecture or the infra infrastructure of the skin but it does something else that is just as important. And this is called dynamic reciprocity. There is actually communication, as per work by Schultz and colleagues, communication between the extracellular matrix and other cells in the wound, like fibroblasts and endothelial cells. So if you destroy that extracellular matrix, not only are you destroying the architecture of the wound, but you're also disconnecting the communication. Now, we are talking about autologous blood clot. How does this really factor in? Well, the autologous blood clot may serve as a bolster or even a replacement for the extracellular matrix. Now, blood is very complex. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, a clotting cascade, which uh, has complexity far beyond this lecture. Needless to say, there are 13 clotting factors, and of course, after there's blood vessel damage, the underlying collagen is exposed to circulating platelets. The platelets have alpha granules, which will release things like platelet-derived growth factor. They will create a platelet plug or a fibrin plug. You have an intrinsic pathway or an injury pathway. You have an extrinsic pathway, which really involves everything else. And again, you can see just from this very... Um, uh, uh, interesting cartoon that this is extraordinarily complex. Now looking at this diagram, you see tissue injury through coagulation, early inflammation, late inflammation, and proliferation. A whole host of things are occurring here. You have bacteria, you have platelets, you have the fibrin clot, neutrophils, macrophages, fibroblasts, collagen, a whole host of growth factors, a tumor necrosis factor, etc. etc. So very, very complex indeed. Now the complement cascade that we talked about has been shown not only to play a role in inflammation, but in augmenting wound healing as well. Macrophages are extraordinarily important. We see them certainly in, in, in a large numbers, in large numbers in the proliferative phase of wound healing, and also or rather in the inflammatory phase uh, of wound healing, because what's happening is during that phase, you have phagocytosis, and the macrophages are basically eating up or gobbling up the bacteria. But there are two basic types of macrophages, M1 and M2. M1 is a pro-inflammatory macrophage, and as you move through the acute wound healing cascade, you develop M2, which has an anti-inflammatory effect. However, one can understand fairly quickly that if you have a wound that's stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing, you're going to have a propensity towards M1, which is pro-inflammatory. This is referred to as dynamic mac macrophage plasticity. 
And it's a very, very important occurrence. And of course, in chronic wounds, you may not have the benefit of this transition. So these are the components of blood. And of course, just a whole host of white cells, macrophages, etc. So let's try to hypothesize why autologous blood clot tissue may be affected. Well, first and foremost, it may function as a tissue, tissue sealant and a, ultimately a drug delivery system. When I talk about a drug delivery system, we're talking about basically the fact that growth factors in multiple amounts can pour out of this autologous blood clot tissue. You get the production of multiple growth factors, which stimulates tissue vascularity by an increase in angiogenesis. Of course, angiogenesis basically is the budding of new blood vessels from those that have been damaged. You also may have an effect on vascular genesis as well, which comes from the bone marrow. Certainly this could create a signaling mechanism. You may prevent infection via macrophages. We talked about the fact that it is phagocytic and certainly will kind of gobble up that bacteria that is sitting in the wound. We know that it acts as a scaffold to bolster or replace the extracellular matrix it fosters wound contraction. And we feel that it may stimulate pluripotent stem cell recruitment. These are all very, very important and significant factors in wound healing. So again, just another diagram, just looking at the phases of wound healing. But what I wanted to show you here was the complexity of what is actually going on. The chemokines, cytokines, growth factors, the immune proliferation and migration, angiogenesis, uh, ultimately a, a, a reformation of the extracellular matrix and collagen deposition. Angiogenesis, of course, uh, along with collagen deposition occurring in the proliferative phase of wound healing. But if you are going to treat these patients, of course, start with traditional wound care, offloading debridement, moist wound healing. If you're not getting closure in a reasonable period of time, two to four weeks, it's very, very important that you move to some kind of advanced therapy. This could be silver, this could be iodine, this could be a collagen, a whole host of therapeutic regimes. And of course, if they are not working in a reasonably short period of time, despite the fact that you're debriding and you're offloading, you have to move to an active dressing, an active therapy, which is actually going to turn the light switch on, if you will, and create the body's physiologic response, both extrinsically and intrinsically. So I think we can reasonably say from a, a hypothesis point of view that it's likely that the extracellular matrix and the chronic wound bed signals the blood clot to give the wound what it needs when it needs it. So it's just not a single growth factor. It is a multiplicity of growth factors that are basically utilized at the appropriate times. And this is an example of what that blood clot looks like in clinical practice. Let's talk a little bit about angiogenic stimulators and inhibitors. What's happening in a normal a wound healing cascade is there's this balance between stimulators and inhibitors. But of course, when you have a chronic wound, uh, you have uh, a pro-inflammatory state and you're going to have a lot of inhibitors present along with growth factors and other elements. This was, I thought, a very interesting concept by Kuhn and colleagues. The concept of therapeutic angiogenesis is aimed at locally applying growth factors in excess, in excess, to override existing inhibitors. And this certainly makes sense. So I think we can hypothesize that topical blood products have been shown to produce growth factors that clearly could stimulate angiogenesis. And again, you see these growth factors in large amounts coming from this blood clot tissue. And this overriding of existing inhibitors is likely occurring. And of course, this is just a, an example of what a blood clot may look like. So let's turn our attention to the current cell and tissue-based products that are out there. Uh, we have several. We have autologous. Some examples would be a split thickness skin graft or a full thickness skin graft. 
Epidermal blister grafts, of course, which basically use heat and negative pressure to create these blisters that you can ultimately remove and transport to the wound itself, acts almost as if you, you did a split thickness skin graft with a dermatome. Uh, very, very interesting technology. And of course, you have uh, platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Again, there's a growing body of evidence that this growth factor product uh, from the blood uh, can uh, certainly uh, aid in healing. But again, we're talking here about one growth factor predominantly. You have allergenic products uh, like um, living skin equivalents. You have cadaveric allograft. You have a whole host of amniotic membranes that you can see in a dehydrated form, in a cryopreserved form, or even a fresh frozen form at this point. And many others will likely come. Uh, again, a growing body of evidence that these products work well. You have a xenographic approach. You can use porcine, bovine, bladder, uh, the sub, uh, submucosa of the small intestines of a pig, equine tissue, whole host of products with a growing body of evidence. Some have been around for decades, others are new. But what I want you to turn your attention to uh, is the autologous therapeutic regimes. There's tremendous benefits in using autologous therapies. Number one, there's biocompatibility. Two, there's reduced risk associated with disease transmission. Three, there's a minimal chance of rejection. So all three very, very important elements. Of course, this was a paper that we just uh, actually is in press. Uh, it's going to be published in the, in the Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association, just looking at this mechanism of action and the benefits of autologous products. So autologous blood clot tissue clearly has several benefits. Number one, it's a protective covering. Number two, it's a biologic scaffold. Three, it stimulates the normal healing cascade. Four, and very importantly, it's an unlimited resource. The blood is, is going to be there when you need it. It's a point of care evaluation and treatment. And of course, that makes it very cost efficient. You don't need a laboratory to make the blood. The blood is already in place. Now this tissue I, a slide I thought was, was very, very important for you to see. This was an electron microscopy of the stromal matrix observed in a topical autologous blood clot tissue. So not only do you see cells, but you see this very, very significant and robust stromal matrix. And this stromal matrix represents a true cell and tissue-based therapy, which allows proliferation of cells and also creates wound contraction because it basically hugs the edges of the tissue. And as it begins to degrade, you will get contraction of the wound. So let's look at some of the current evidence relating to autologous blood clot tissue. Well, the first study basically uh, was published in 2016 by, um, by Kushner et al. Looked at the efficacy and safety of this novel autologous product in a complicated chronic wound model. They looked at a whole host of different types of wounds in very seriously ill patients with multiple underlying comorbidities. They looked at nine chronic wounds that were treated with, with 35 clot matrices. They found that there was complete healing achieved in seven out of nine wounds, so this was 78%. There were no systemic adverse events that occurred. So in conclusion, this pilot study demonstrated that autologous whole blood matrix was effective, at least in this pilot study, and it was safe for treating patients with chronic wounds of various different etiologies. It was a good start but of course, larger clinical trials were needed. And this is an example of what the blood clot actually looks like when it's applied. And we'll talk a little bit about how that actually occurs in just a moment. I was involved in a study in 2018, looking at the safety and efficacy of an autologous blood clot product in the management of Texas 1A and 2A neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers. 
This was a prospective multi-center trial, but it was an open label pilot study. Let's take a look at the results. So we looked at 20 patients that were enrolled. The proportions of patients healed at 12 weeks is what we were interested in looking at as the primary endpoint. We looked at the intent to treat group and the per protocol group, or just to remove as much bias as possible. In the intent to treat group, we had 65% healing, 13 out of 20 patients healed, and in the per protocol group, 13 out of 18 healed, giving us a yield of about 72%. Percent error reduction, of course, which is uh, uh, very important to me when looking at these studies. The intent to treat group at four and six weeks, respectively, were about 62% and 67%. The per protocol at four and 12 weeks was about 60%, and 76% respectively. The mean time to wound healing in the intent to treat group was about 60 days and in the per protocol group, 56 days. So again, clearly showed and demonstrated that the blood clot product was safe and efficacious for treating diabetic foot ulcers. Now I think looking at these um, data points, uh, it's clear that we need more data. And of course, there is now an ongoing pivotal randomized controlled trial comparing autologous blood clot tissue to standard care. Standard care in this case will be debridement, a cam walker or a walking boot, and foam. The study is ongoing. Um, it will be a large study. And uh, hopefully within the next 12 months, we will have some very important results to share with the wound care community. This again is an example of what that clot may look like. Now this uh, study was also just a compilation or an analysis analyzing three prospective open label trials utilizing autologous blood clot tissue. And what I felt was really important here was it showed and it demonstrated efficacy of healing acute and chronic wounds, both in vitro and in vivo. The analysis was consistent with the efficacy results in previous trials, demonstrating the high effectiveness of healing chronic wounds with the use of an autologous blood clot tissue product. So if one were going to actually use this product in clinical practice, it's a very, very simple thing to accomplish. First and foremost, you need to draw the blood. This is done with a standard phlebotomy kit. And uh, what's going to happen is you're going to um, draw 15 cc's of blood. Uh, calcium gluconate will be added to aid in the clotting mechanism. And you're going to basically transfer it to this little dome-shaped structure here. And that dome-shaped structure has kaolin in it as well further enhanced clotting. So that's kind of the secret sauce, if you will. And over a period of somewhere between 10 to 12 minutes, you wind up with a blood clot that looks like this. It's very robust, it's meaty, um, uh, it's malleable. You can actually even cut it if you wanted to. Uh, and sometimes it becomes challenging, particularly in patients who, um, who uh, are on anticoagulants or even aspirin. Um, so again, be mindful of that, uh, but um, we have found, at least in, in utilizing this in clinical practice, that you can put this over just about any size wound. And uh, it's basically held in place with a mesh gauze matrix. And of course, that's going to also be reinforced with Steri-Strip. So again, a very, very easy process indeed, a very, very quick, uh, and again, um, an unlimited source because blood is actually what it is we're utilizing. This is an example of an application of a topically applied blood clot tissue to the plantar aspect of the foot in a patient with diabetes. And, and what's important to understand here is you can see very plainly that this wound is very well prepared. You have beveled wound edges, you have a very, very robust and healthy uh, uh, area of granulation tissue. There's no tunneling. There's no undermining. There's probably a, a low level of bacteria, a low level of enzymes here, because if you don't prepare the wound 
appropriately, and you have high levels of enzymes, high levels of bacteria, also producing their own enzymes, and you use any advanced product, that advanced product will be nothing more than a good meal for those substrates. So something certainly to keep in mind. So moving from this, we now apply the blood clot. And this is what it looks like in a, in a fairly large wound. And it's uh, it kept in place with steri strips. Now I show you this picture because it was the first time I had ever applied a blood clot product to a patient. This was on the plantar heel in a diabetic patient's wound. Just think in terms of the fact that blood is basically the essence of life. You're taking blood, you're drawing blood from an individual, their own blood, you're creating a clot and you're using that clot to heal a wound. It's just unbelievable. So when I thought in terms of this and I looked at it, two things came to mind and they in fact were concerns. First of all, you had this big, big kind of lump, if you will, of tissue that was protruding out. And I was concerned this tissue would just slide off, even with the best of offloading intentions, uh, this wouldn't stay. And secondly, I was also concerned about maceration. Well, neither of them occurred. Uh, when I took the dressing off one week later, this blood clot was completely flat, and there was a hole right in the center of it where all the fluid from the wound itself had drained out. So there was absolutely no maceration at all at the wound site. Again, we put this on a gauze matrix and we fastened it uh, with steri strips. Very, very simple procedure. Of course, we use a bulky dressing here um, and we use appropriate offloading, but um, I just thought this, this was a, an absolutely magnificent photograph uh, of what it is we're actually dealing with. So I wanted to share it with you. So let's look at some case studies. This is, uh, a 77-year-old white male with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and neuropathy. There was an element of peripheral arterial disease. He had gout, AFib. He uh, was on a multiplicity of medications. He had a very long history of smoking. He was a 15-pack years smoking. His laboratory data were really significant because his hemoglobin A1C was, was 9.7. He was, a, he was a little anemic. Um, his other blood work was not terribly unremarkable, a, a terribly remarkable rather. Uh, but what was concerning here was the fact that he was diabetic, that his diabetes was not necessarily controlled. Um, he had a diabetic ulcer uh, 2A, as per the University of Texas, uh, right heel, 30 weeks in duration, a long time to have an ulceration of any kind. The wound measured about four um, by uh, 0.5, Moderate amount of serous or serous sanguineous drainage was noted, and the patient's ABI was approximately 1.1. So again, uh, we did a little bit more vascular testing here. We did a, uh, a toe pressure, and et cetera. And we found and felt confident that this patient had adequate vascularity to support healing. But look at what he had had in the past. Went to dry dressings, foams, silver alginates. He had HBO. He, he had skin grafts. He had multiple skin substitutes and regular surgical debridement. He was offloaded initially in a total contact cast and, and then a boot. Didn't work. Something needed to be added to help this patient heal. So if you look at day zero, of course, this was before the wound was prepared. This wound had to be thoroughly debrided. Uh, and uh, we had to make sure that this wound was in bacterial and bile balance. And then we moved, of course, to application of the autologous blood clot tissue. By day 35, this is what the wound looked like, and by day 78, the wound had healed. Now, sometimes you will see a bump um, in the size of the wound because you're debriding it. So it's not unusual to see that, and that certainly should not be disconcerting to you because over time, this wound went on to heal very expeditiously. Now this is a patient that we see often, more often now than probably ever before in our practices. This is a 98 year old white male. Had a multiplicity of problems, he was on long-term Coumadin, he had CHF, he had a stage four right heel ulcer with chronic osteomyelitis in the right ankle and foot. 
adenostasis disease and vitamin D deficiency. He was at times malnourished. He was anemic. You have to look at it. All you need to do is look at his blood work, his H and H, and his hemoglobin, uh, as a- albumin rather, to understand that he was uh, not doing very well. And of course, uh, this patient was initially offered hospice uh, or an amputation. Uh, He refused both. He was admitted to the hospital with a left femur fracture, ultimately uh, had an eight-month-old ulcer. The heels were very boggy. Um, He uh, had an MRI. He had an MRI, which clearly showed osteomyelitis. Uh, uh, The patient had an infectious disease, a consult on several occasions. It was ultimately determined that the patient would not benefit from any additional antibiotics. Santal, mesol, negative pressure, whole host of other dressings were utilized. The wound was a little bit smelly, so uh, at some point, flagell was used to control the odor. And he was offloaded with offloading heel boots uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and of course, um, he was up most of the day in a wheelchair. So here, here's the patient on day one. Here's the patient on day 13 after utilizing weekly applications of the autologous blood clot tissue. And here's what the patient looks like at day 19. Now this last case I want to show you is not my case. It's a case by Dr. Naz Wahab. Dr. Wahab used a very interesting therapy for this patient. And what intrigued me here was the fact that the treatment that was rendered was probably something that I would have done differently. As an example, I likely would have removed this bone. But as it turned out, it wasn't necessary. This was a 67-year-old female, end-stage renal disease, which is an independent predictor of non-healing, diabetes, PAD. Uh, The patient had gangrene of the great toe. He failed a first ray. She failed a first ray amputation. She failed a trans med amputation. And even though this wound looks like it's granulating appropriately, uh, the wound just failed to resolve. The patient had negative pressure, had HBO. Nothing was working. So... Because kind of as a Hail Mary, if you will, Dr. Wahab used the autologous uh, blood clot tissue matrix. And here is the patient on week one. Week two, that bone is almost completely covered. By week four, the bone is covered. By week five, you can't even see the bone. And look at week six. It's beautiful. It looks amazing. This patient did extraordinarily well. And of course, through week seven and week eight, we got to a point here um, where clearly the doctor could have used uh, uh, either another blood clot uh, product uh, again, or uh, just taken the patient for a split thickness skin graft. Again, very successful intervention with this autologous blood clot tissue. So in summary, topically applied autologous blood products will augment healing according to the data that we have. But of course, studies are ongoing. Uh, We feel that it stimulates growth factor production, it mitigates infection, it bolsters or replaces the extracellular matrix. It's evidence-based, it's very easy to use, it's point of care, and it's cost-effective. So I thank you very much for your time, uh, and uh, I open the floor to any questions. Thank you again. The first question uh, is a simple one, um, and that is, why not just smear platelets on the wound? So what is the additional advantage of, um, of this uh, red dress technology? It's a very good question. So when you're using platelets on the wound, you're basically just using one set of growth factors, predominantly platelet-derived growth factor. There are others, but predominantly platelet-derived growth factor. Uh, There is no true matrix that is formed, so you're not getting an ingrowth of cells from the the margins of the wound, that you're not getting an ingrowth. Um, You're not filling, for all intents and purposes, that hole that's been created by uh, destruction of the extracellular matrix. So you still have that disconnect potentially between the communication of the extracellular matrix and other cells in the wound like fibroblastin and endothelial cells. Additionally, uh, you will not get contraction of the wound if you just kind of apply um, platelets or or let's say a single growth factor uh, onto the wound itself. So it's really very, very different. You're talking about a cell and tissue based therapy by definition versus just the application of 
one growth factor or a limited set of growth factors at the wound site. The, 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 the autologous blood clot product that gives you significantly more advantages. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question uh, is a practical one. What type of, of vacutainer tube is drawn, is used to draw the blood purple top? So um, there is a um, there is a tube that comes with the kit. Um, I'm not sure what color it is, quite frankly, but it is something that is specific because it has uh, a calcium gluconate uh, in it, um, and um, uh, it's done uh, just the same way that you would draw any blood for any reason. Okay, I think you answered this, but just uh, for clarity. Uh, what is the difference between this and PRP? So again, PRP, um, there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, surrounding PRP, but again, it is a, it is, uh, a, a limited uh, number of growth factors that are going to be um, uh, placed into the wound. You don't have that stromal matrix. You don't have the ability for wound contraction. Um, there are uh, significantly more byproducts and substrates, as well as this uh, this lattice network uh, that is created that we don't see with PRP. So, although PRP, I think, is a is a good therapy, and we have used it, and it, is, it does have other applicability in other areas of medicine as well. I think that that this particular therapy uh, far exceeds what the PRP in and of itself uh, may be able to do, in my opinion. Uh, next question, can we use blood from a different person with the same blood group? Um, yeah. That has never, that has never, to my knowledge, been tested. But again, this is um, uh, something that should be taken from the person. Um, so it should be autologous uh, in nature. Um, uh, taking it from another person, um, again, has never been studied and uh, likely uh, would not be a good idea. Okay. Um, can you freeze and reuse the product if the wound is small enough? Uh, I guess the, the idea is to um, have multiple uses from the same preparation. So to date, um, I know of no studies where we've been able to freeze the product and then go ahead and thaw it out and reuse it. Uh, you can, um, even in a smaller wound, you can either cut the, um, the blood clot itself, it, it, it sometimes gets a little runny when you do that. It's sometimes not practical, particularly in patients who are on anticoagulants, even aspirin. Um, but um, you can actually put the product on and cover more than the size of the wound. Um, again, uh, my experience uh, what, with the product was that um, there was absolutely no maceration at all, even if it extended far beyond the edges of, of the wound itself. Uh, the drainage actually comes out of a little hole, which is created, uh, I guess, uh, naturally. Uh, and actually, the fluid is, is uh, dispersed into the dressing itself so that when the product is, um, is reviewed a week later and whatever redundancy is removed, uh, I have never seen maceration. And again, we, we put this on a, a, a fairly large number of, of patients uh, without any problem. So I would not suggest that it be frozen. It's never been studied. Uh, and the whole beauty of this product, besides the things that we mentioned scientifically, is that it is a point of care uh, test and, and can and should be used at point of care. Uh, is there a risk of the oxidative impact of erythrocytes on certain wounds causing a potential negative effect? We have not uh, seen in any of the studies that were done and the studies that are ongoing, we have not seen that occurring. So um, I would venture to say that the likelihood is, is, is very remote. And again, we haven't, we haven't seen it to this point and it has been used on a large number of patients. Also, it's been used in Israel as well on even a larger cohort of people. And I, I don't recall seeing any, any, uh, uh, anything written or anything discussed that that would uh, be a factor. Uh, is there a risk of the oxidative impact of erythrocytes on certain wounds causing a potential negative effect? We have not uh, seen in any of the studies that were done and the studies that are ongoing, we have not seen that occurring. So 
um, I would venture to say that the likelihood is 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 very remote. And again, we haven't we haven't seen it to this point, and it has been used on a large number of patients. Also, it's been used in Israel as well on even a larger cohort of people. And I, I don't recall seeing any any uh, uh, anything written or anything discussed that that would uh, be a factor. Okay, and thanks for sticking with us through this. There's one more question, or uh, actually another one just just came in. It looked like the clot when applied was oozing through the four by four. What type of dressing uh, do you recommend putting over it? So you want a bulky dressing in place. Um, we can use a, a foam over there. We can use uh, some non-adherent dressing. It basically is attached to a kind of a, a, an open weave gauze. So you put it directly over there. You attach it, as you saw in the, in the photographs, with steri strips. And then you, uh, I would recommend that you apply a, a, a rather bulky dressing, particularly if it's going to be on the plantar aspect of the foot. Um, I think that would uh, prevent uh, any any dislodging of the clot uh, when the patient walked. Uh, certainly offloading will have to be continued. All those are the things that we know are important, particularly the offloading component uh, has to be kept in place. Uh, but um, uh, that would be my, my recommendation. Uh, bulk it up to the point where you uh, are not going to have any any risk of dislodging that clot. But and again, to to in my experience, uh, we have never seen that occur. Okay. Well, just one more question, and then um, and then we're, we'll give the CME instructions. Um, have you applied it over clean bone? Um, I personally have not applied it over clean bone, but that last slide that I did show you, that case from from the other physician, ha he had applied it over bone. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I told you uh, uh, in the lecture that. Um, I would have likely removed that or cut that bone back, but he elected not, or she rather elected not to. Um, and it still worked out extremely well. That bone just completely covered, and ultimately that wound went on to heal. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Snyder, and we'll see you next time. My pleasure. Thank you.